Okay. All right, everyone. We have six people calling in that are here for the webinar. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Jules Yun. I'm a, a science officer for the Future Earth Health Knowledge Action Network. Um, and together with uh, Josh Duskbury, who's the um, Global Hub Director in Colorado, um, we'll be uh, presenting you a little bit on the Climate, Environment, and Health CRA, uh, Collaborative Research Action. Um, Future Earth played a key role in the scoping process to make this call happen. Um, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, when you have questions, just feel free to use uh, the functions on the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can press chat and uh, you can write your question in the chat directly to everybody or you can just write maybe an explanation mark um, or use the raise your hand function. Um, so please go ahead and uh, try that out. If uh, you have any problems, just uh, shout out to me, maybe just in the beginning here. And then next uh, we can have uh, Josh start the presentation. Uh, thanks all for, for coming. Um, my name is Josh Tewksbury. I'm a, uh, I'm, first of all, I'm assuming folks can hear me. And if you can't hear or you need me to repeat something, just go ahead and uh, um, you can, there's, there's a hand raising um, function that you can usually see on your screen to raise hand or you can unmute yourself and, and let me know if you can't hear something. So, Sheila, am I coming through clearly okay? I hear you well, yeah. Good, good. All right, thanks so much. And uh, welcome, uh, Chris Ebi, for uh, joining as well. Chris is a member of the, actually the co-chair of the development team for the Health Knowledge Action Network, and so she's been involved with this project since the very beginning. So uh, um, uh, thanks for joining the call, and um, hopefully we'll get some of your insights on this process near, um, when we're doing questions as well. All right, let's see. So. Um, oh, let me see, see if I can get this right. So what I'm going to do quickly, um, I'm just assuming, um, Jules, can you see my screen okay? Yeah, it's coming. Great. Screen. Great. Okay. So I'm assuming this is working fine. And I'm going to do, I'm going to go fairly quickly through a little bit, just a very brief history of the Belmont Forum and Future Earth. Um, and then um, a little bit more about this collaborative research action and how collaborative research actions in general work at the Belmont Forum. Um, a little bit on um, um, how to make sure that team that when you put teams together, they can get through the various hoops that the Belmont Forum puts in place, and then um, and then hopefully get a little bit of uh, communication among participants in this call who might be looking for particular partners or wanting to uh, say a little bit more about what they're bringing to the community or what they're trying to do with the call. So we should finish a little early. We've done one of these. This is our second um, our second uh, webinar of this type. The first one finished a little early as well. Um, so there's usually plenty of time for people to, to ask questions as we go forward. So I'll just, I'll just get moving. Um, so starting with a little bit of an introduction of what Future Earth is in the Belmont Forum. So one way of doing this is to understand the Belmont Forum and Future Earth, it's fairly, it's, it's the best way of thinking about our relationship really is that we, we came, the Belmont Forum and Future Earth were generated out of, out of a similar process it was initiated by many of the same people. And um, there is about a 35-year history of global change research programs being supported by the, by the National Science Foundations of Developed Nations around the world. And these were programs designed to help us study the Earth, study the biodiversity of the Earth, and study the influence of people on the Earth. And, and these programs were funded kind of in, in large disciplinary silos, and about 15, 10, 15 years ago, there was an, a move to start to um, ask researchers and the research community in general to work across disciplines and to work with stakeholders more effectively to, um, to raise the voice of research and science in policy processes and decision making around particularly global change and sustainability issues. And this, this interest in making this happen came to some extent from the funders community who were funding these global change research programs. 
And at least two structures were born out of that, that, that thinking um, about 10 years ago. The first I mean, happened about the same time. One was the Belmont Forum and the other one was Future Earth. And the Belmont Forum is a collaboration of funders. It's a mechanism for mostly public sector funders from across the developed nations and, and some that are in middle and low, in some nations that are a little less developed to come together, pool their resources in a virtual pool and fund global change research that is transdisciplinary, that is interdisciplinary, and then is focused on sustainability issues. At the same time, Future Earth was, was initiated as a platform or a program to help support a community of researchers in, one way, in some ways to respond to those calls, but also to give broader global voice to a, a growing cohort of, of researchers who wanted to work across disciplines and with stakeholders to create research that could more effectively translate into policy and decision processes in a whole range of disciplines, from health to oceans, to um, atmosphere, to land, um, to food, and a whole range of issues, climate change, of course. So the, our, our two structures work together, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Belmont Forum and then just show, and just to say a little bit how Future Earth feeds into this process. Um, let's see if I'll get back to this. So um, before I go, let me just check uh, if I can make sure I can see the actual, um, if there are comments and questions, I want to make sure I can see those. One second. I don't think those show up as easily while I'm speaking. Um, Jules, if you can make sure, if someone asks a question, can you make sure to stop me? Because Can you manage the questions? Definitely, no Maybe, problem. I, so anybody, if questions them. come up, just write in the chat box. and I can write them directly to me or to uh, the, the wider group. That's great. Thank you. So the, the Belmont Forum has, you know, these, these goals here of, you know, co-advancement of science and society, developing transboundary trans capacity to address common needs. So, um, and creating an expectation of transparency between sectors, including industry and in products and communication. And the map here you see on the screen is essentially all the grade areas are countries that have participated in Belmont Forum calls and the connections between them are essentially there to represent the fact that all teams that successfully acquire Belmont Forum resources have on them members from at least three Belmont Forum countries. And so every successful Belmont Forum project, every project team that receives funding is a, is a transboundary project, is a pro team. They come from at least three Belmont Forum countries and they are working together on a single project. Um, let's see if I can, there's a couple, couple more things to say about Belmont Forum. I think this, this here, there's, there's actually this graphic here is, is fairly important when thinking about Belmont Forum from the standpoint of an individual investigator um, writing a research proposal. Because what the Belmont Forum is, is essentially a virtual pooling of money. So there are approximately 32 agencies that are a part of the Belmont Forum from 29 countries. Um, they all um, get together every year. And one of the major roles of Future Earth is to give them um, coherent, well-documented, well, um, um, within the research community um, and well scoped within the research community advice on the topics they should put their funding into. And Belmont Forum has several partners. We are the only partner that does this every year. So we present to the Belmont Forum um, what are called collaborative research actions. They are well scoped doc documents that say within this topic, we think these are the most important research questions. And we have, we have worked with scientists across the world to develop these recommendations for a call in, for example, ocean sustainability, or in, in this case, climate, environment, and health. Um, and then we take that to the Belmont Forum. The members of the Belmont Forum will oftentimes raise their hand, will, will, will decide whether they are interested in supporting that call. And then that then goes to their own scoping process. Um, so what, what ends up happening at the end of this process is what you see on the Belmont Forum website, a, a public call for participation by researchers um, to acquire funding to address a specific global change or sustainability issue. It's well documented in the call text and then has specific annexes where different countries, different funders have designated what their funding can be used for. 
And so this, the, the, the graphic here shows a bunch of small circles. And so, for example, if the purple circle is the funding from an agency like the National Science Foundation in, in the U.S., and the, the, the red is a circle from the um, NERC, which is the, which is the equivalent funding agency in the UK, and the brown might be NRF, which is the funding agency in South Africa, or, um, or, the, or, the, or in Germany. They put in funding. It is all directed towards this, the same call. And then when researchers apply, a researcher, could, a team could include someone from South Africa, someone from the US, someone from the UK, all of them, a successful proposal from that team would result in all of those researchers getting funded, but they would be funded from their national funding agencies. So if you're from South Africa, you'd get your funding from NRF, from the UK, from NERC, from the US, from NSF, or in this case, potentially support from, NSF, from NIH or from NOAA because of the, the sources of the funds. And so in this way, the, the call designates not only who, which countries are participating, but how much funding each country is putting in and, which, uh, and, and from where and, and the eligibility of, princ of potential principal investigators to, to compete or to, to, uh, to be a part of a team. If your country is not a part of a Belmont Forum call, that simply means that in that particular call, there are no funds available for researchers from that country. There are a few, a few exceptions to that, and I'll get into that in just a second. Um, so that's the, that's the basic way that the process works. Um, and let's see, I will, Gilles, should I continue or did I see, I saw a note, something that suggested there might be hands, but I can't see the chat box. Yeah, yeah things are so good on here. You can just carry on. Carry on, okay, excellent. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna talk more specifically about this collaborative research action. Um, this is one that was initiated through conversations um, that Chris Ebay was on this call was a part of and the other, the other members of the, of the Health Knowledge Action Network within Future Earth. We wrote an initial, well they wrote an initial scoping document, the health researchers within that community. And then um, the Secretariat, which I'm a part of, supported a process to gather input from researchers and institutions involved in planetary health, climate change, and the intersection of, you know, of climate, environment, and health on the text that we had written. We then presented that at the Belmont Forum plenary meeting, and it was adopted by the Belmont Forum. They then took that, did their own further scoping, because ultimately the funding agencies that are a part of the call have to take responsibility for the text in that call. And they, they generally change what we give them to some extent, given where they're funding, um, what they can fund now versus later, and, uh, and what the, the particular national linkages are between the, with their own interests and the call that we present. So what you see on the website is the result of that two-step process. Um, <clears throat> in this case, um, what resulted is a series of three themes and I should, I should start, stop right here and say that one of the main outcomes of the process that we were involved in and that the Belmont Forum took on was the recognition that there were more really important topics um, in this space than they could possibly fund in the first, in, in a single collaborative research action. So what you see on the Belmont Forum website is a first call within climate, environment, and health. And there's, there's both a pledge and an interest and an enthusiasm within Belmont Forum members in continuing to offer additional calls in this space um, at, you know, as time goes on. So we hope to see a multi-call process um, go forward over the next several years, this being that first call. Um, and the themes within that first call were our food systems and nutrition, health and heat, climate and climate senses, sensitive infectious diseases. And this text here, you can find this text and more detail within the call text itself. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, but that's, these are the, the, the actual themes that were at, at, on that. And then the proposal aims, um, you know, what, what, they're, what they're aiming for is to bridge knowledge gaps on environmental pathways, feedbacks, and interactions that connect climate change to human disease, understand health risk, vulnerability, and resilience, improve predictability and early warning of the frequency and extent of climate and climate-related environmental hazards to health, 
and deliver usable data, information, tools, services, and effective innovation solutions that allow decision makers to better prepare for climate change impacts on health. It's important to note that a single proposal doesn't have to do all of these things. Um, and there is always a balance that research that proposers are striking between the, um, the in, in their team structure and in their agenda between the fundamental science that they want to come they want to complete and the linkage of that science and the connection of that science to um, to the to stakeholder communities to user group communities the 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 amount of investment in the establishment of the the tools the services um, and the solution sets that are more than science, but are rely on that science base um, for their creation. And I can talk more about that in Q&A about sort of how that balance is struck and how the review process works. Um, a couple of pieces around the proposal eligibility and requirements. This, this is essentially for every single Belmont Forum call. Um, first of all, um, the only teams that can successfully obtain funding, and I spoke about this a bit earlier, um, are teams that include principal investigators from three participating partner agencies established in three different countries. And that's important to note because a team that consists of one individual PI getting funding from the National Science Foundation in the US, another getting funding um, or support and indirect support for, say, from say NOAA, and a third person coming in from NERC, for example, or Tibutak in Turkey would not be an acceptable team because it only has two countries represented. So you need to have individuals that are participants in your core team that are from at least three countries. Um, it's also a fundamental part of the calls that natural sciences, social sciences, and stakeholders are a, are a part of every core team that goes in. And in particular, in this call, they've extended that to say, we really wanna make sure that your stakeholders or your decision processes, you also have health experts in there both potentially in the health experts in the academic side and potentially in your stakeholder side as well. And then economic sciences are also fully applicable. And so there's a desire in the Belmont Forum to see well-integrated cross-disciplinary or interdisciplinary teams that are working also with integrated stakeholder communities. Stakeholders or decision makers, oftentimes that can be civil society organizations, that are a part of the proposal development. Um, there, is, there are fairly stringent data requirements with any Belmont Forum call. They have been some, something of a leader in trying to promote open data standards within National Science Foundations around the world, and so they promote that within their calls. That creates a little bit of a, a, an added hoop for some individual investigators to jump through, so you need a, a strong data management plan. Um, and then, um, the last bullet point here is really about checking your annexes. And I'll go to the website if I have time at the end of this to show you where you find those. But if you, when, you, when you approach a Belmont Forum call, it's important to look at uh, where your funding as an individual part of a team is going to come from and what the restrictions are for that funding. Some funders will fund only basic science research. Other funders will fund only innovation research. A few funders in calls will only fund people in the private sector to be a part of a call. And so recognizing where you sit and what your eligibility is and where your funding comes from and then the restrictions on that funding make it a lot easier to figure out how to design a proposal that matches the resources being provided in this collaborative structure with the team and the products and the activities that you're proposing. All right, I'm gonna move forward here. Um, whoop, went fast. Okay, so a few deadlines. These are on the website as well. Um, we've seen the call launch. Um, we, the, the next deadline is May 6th. Um, and this is essentially that first, the first, um, what is, is it EOL's expression of? Expression of interest. Oh, that's, an, that's a capital I. Okay, got yes. it. Yes, sorry. Yes, that's what I was looking for, but I was trying to make the L work. Um, so the expression of interests are, um, are there because what they first want to do when looking at teams coming in is to make sure that they, own, that they catch teams that are ineligible early so they don't, they don't go through all the work of creating full proposals only to find out that they are not eligible given their team makeup, where they're from, or some other criteria that they're not meeting. 
So an expression of interest should clearly hit the major key components of a Belmont Forum call, showing clearly that you have the key components of natural, physical, health, social sciences in your, uh, um, in, in your team, as well as some you know, uh, stakeholder community member that's in your team, and also being careful to understand that you're, you are meeting that three country criteria. Um, you can have members of your team that are not from Belmont Forum funded countries. It's not as if you need to limit yourself to that. It's just that um, with the current funding in the call, some members of the team may be relying on other funding sources to join or to coordinate. And in the last call, we actually had some, some contributions from, you know, from team, team members that were doing just that. Um, and then there are full, as a full proposal deadline. Uh, one note at this point is, is to just recognize how a little bit about how the sausage is made in the back end of the Belmont Forum or how the, how the, how the proposal selection process is, um, it, it takes place. What happens in the Belmont Forum is when proposals come in, um, they are trying to match the funding available from different sources with the proposal pool that comes forward. So if Tibutak in Turkey only has $500,000 on the table for this call, then they may only be able to fund one team with a Turkish researcher on it. And that 500,000 would go to that team and that researcher. If a country, NERC, who's putting in significant funding into this um, in the UK, they may be able to fund six or eight teams uh, with, with researchers from the United Kingdom a part of them. So looking at where the money is coming from is also sort of a part of thinking about how to structure your team. Um, let's see. Okay, so that I talked a little bit about annexes and eligibility and ineligibility, but this list, um, the finding this list, going, so one, if you haven't gone to the bfgo.org, bfgo.org website, that's the most, that, that website gives you all the details right at the top for this call. So it'll tell you, it'll, it'll give you the most updated information on which organizations are participating. This is the list we have right now, how much money they're putting in, what, um, what restrictions there are on the funding based on each one of those um, each, each one of those uh, participating organizations, and, and, and then any other restrictions. And I, and I, I think it's, imp it's important because this list could change slightly as we go forward. It shouldn't change much, but there's, there's really a big push to add a few extra members that might happen a little bit later in the process. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. I mean, one of the things to note from this is that if you're from Brazil, uh, um, Taipei, Kotovar, Finland, oops, sorry, Norway, Sweden, Turkey, US, United Kingdom, there's, there's specific money set aside for researchers from all of those places. If you're from another country, it's less easy to acquire these funds. And I'll talk a little bit about some efforts that are going on currently to try and broaden the tent so that individuals and researchers that are applying to be pr principal investigators from countries not listed here might have a chance to, uh, to, um, to to contribute. Hi, Josh. Um, there was actually a relevant question that came in uh, regarding to this slide uh, by Wen Liao from the People's Republic of China, who's asking that whether or not this person is eligible. Uh, so, you know, so it's. I think it's important to recognize that um, it's a great question, and so if 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 your if if the if the funding agency from your country is not a part of the call, then getting direct resources from this call is going to be difficult. There are exceptions, but for China, it's actually it's um, um, it's a little bit trickier because for um, the, the most of the exceptions will come for the lower and middle income countries, um, particularly in the, and I'll talk about this in a, in a bit later. Um, so I think that there are. Um, it, it's not that you would be Ill, Ill, ineligible, but it would restrict your ability to obtain direct resources. So you could certainly join a team. For example, in the last call, we had a team, uh, a coordinator for a team based in Italy, and Italy is also not on this list. They were coordinating an, a team that had three, had principal investigators in three other countries that were on the list. From the Belmont's Forum perspective, they can only, they have to give their funding typically 
to researchers that reside within institutions in their country. And there are some exceptions to that, but not many. And I'll talk a little bit about that in later. So far, I don't think any of the exceptions that I know of that, have, I know of, that are being worked on would support um, direct research funds going to someone, in, in going to People's Republic of China at this point. Don't think so. But I, I, I'm happy to, to, to take that up to Erica Key at the Belmont Forum. Um, so, oops, sorry, what is this? Okay, so, so, so let, me, let, me, let me just say a couple, I'm gonna go through a, a couple more slides that represent some questions that we received um, coming into this call. And it, it's direct, it, it sort of elaborates explicitly on, on the point that was just raised in, raised in the question. Um, so, and the question was really, you know, can applicants from lower, lower income and lower and middle income countries um, receive funding um, um, or in-kind support? And, um, and the answer probably most honestly is not yet, and we're working on it. Um, so the reason, the reason I say it that way is that we, there is a fairly concerted effort to bring in one or more funder that, does, that is not restricted in its funding by national boundaries. And um, so there's, and we're, we're fairly confident we'll be able to bring in a funder of that type. Um, and the, the whole, the whole um, process for doing that really, um, the, the impetus, the desire is to broaden the community that can um, participate in these calls to, and get direct support. And recognizing, of course, that many of the challenges we face in climate and environment and health take place and are, and are most acute in countries that are not on this list of, uh, of funders. Uh, we really would like to see principal investigators coming from the places that are most impacted by, by the changes that we're studying. Um, and yet the structure of science makes that challenging because in most national science foundations around the world, they're limited in their ability to fund researchers to researchers that work within their national borders or excuse me, researchers that, are, that work in institutions within their national borders. And um, so there, are, there, there is absolutely opportunity for any researcher to take part in a team and receive, for example, travel funds and be a part of, the, of all parts of the proposal development. Fundamentally, however, it's very difficult for a researcher to participate without some research funding going directly into their laboratory. And I think that's well recognized by the funders themselves. Um, it is a challenging problem to fix. Um, we hope to bring on such a funder that would help support a broader coalition, the broader coalitions coming in. And likely, if that happens, that will be done between the, uh, the deadline on May 6th for the expression of interest and the full proposal date. So, there's, um, so that's why checking the BFGO website is quite useful. And th the other important strategy point here is, at this point, if, you're, if your research is taking place in a, in a region that is not on this list, and you feel it's really important to include a principal investigator or a key member of your, of your team from that region, um, and they're willing to, be, to help work on that expression of interest without knowing whether or not they will be um, eligible to receive direct support through the Belmont Forum, I think it's very much to the advantage of the team to include that person, to bring them on, and then um, it, particularly if they're from a lower and middle income country, um, there may be direct support coming for them if, if we're successful in bringing in some external funders. And, and I should say that in some ways, Belmont Forum works like this on all its calls. There's a core group of public sector funders that have limitations in how they can fund. And that core group then works to, to bring in partners that can expand their ability to create, to create calls that are more inclusive than they can fund on their own. So they try and leverage their funds. Um, that process in this particular call is ongoing and a little bit late in, um, in its, in its uh, execution. Let's see. Um, if I can come up. So other questions that have come up. Um, a couple of questions that I think are a little bit more granular but important to, to recognize. In this particular call, for example, in the U.S., there are at least three, perhaps four U.S. funding it, U.S. agencies participating in this particular Belmont Forum Collaborative Research Action. And each one of them may have their own annex. And in the annex, it'll say how much money they will provide at most to a team. And so, for example, 
the National Science Foundation may say, you know, we're only going to support teams up to $200,000 per, um, per team. And then NOAA might say, well, we'll, we'll support up to $100,000 per team. You could then combine those so a single PI from the U.S. could receive both of those funds. It's a bit of a granular point, but it's important when thinking about budgets. The other question that came in was about submitting multiple proposals. And we talked to the Belmont Forum about this, and they strongly um, discouraged that approach. Um, and the you know, applicants, they suggested that applicants should submit only one Expression of, in, expression of interest or proposal as a PI or, or co-PI per CRA. It does not mean you couldn't be an advisor or a, a senior personnel in another proposal, but probably not um, a PI or co-PI receiving funds. Um, so other, other questions that came up in, is each international participant required to propose a case study from their own region? And if so, should it be a similar case or can it be vary according to national priorities? So um, th this came up in the, in the poll between when we first announced these webinars. And I think it represents a small, a small confusion as to the restrictions being placed on investigators when applying for these funds. There are not many restrictions in terms of where you work or how you work. Um, and, and there's not even a, there's not even a requirement of a case study. Um, certainly not multiple case studies in all countries where you work. It is perfectly appropriate for three researchers from three different Belmont Forum countries to be working with a collaborator in a fourth country together on one project. And many successful Belmont Forum projects use, use something like that. Um, in other cases, the different organizations within a Belmont Forum team will do something where they're working in parallel in three different countries to examine, for, to examine a similar phenomena in three different contexts, for example. But there's no rules about how to put your proposal together in that regard. The review process is, is very similar to a National Science Foundation review process in most developed and in, in, in developing countries in which um, external reviewers are selected and they're selected based on the pool of, of, of proposals that are submitted. In the Belmont Forum's case, there's a special effort to find reviewers that understand the value of multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary science. And, 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 the, and then the review process is done fairly similar to a standard science review. Two to three reviewers submitting reviews to panelists. In the case of a Belmont Forum review process, there will be a representative from each country, that is um, from each agency, that is providing funds in the decision process, um, receiving the reviews from the expert panels, discussing them in plenary, and deciding which proposals to fund. Um, the, last, uh, the last question here is, how can international consortium project associates interlink, uh, interact during national project implementation for the sake of knowledge transfer? And this is actually a bit of a broader point um, in which, and it, it relates to there, there are at least two parts, two parts of the facilitation of knowledge transfer that Future Earth is engaged in and that Belmont Forum is, is actively trying to promote. One is, um, you know, the challenge that teams face in working in a ge geographically distributed manner. Um, for the most part, that challenge is left up to the teams to solve. It is certainly appropriate and expected for teams to include in their budget the, uh, the appropriate travel they will need to work as an effective team. Um, and, you know, it's oftentimes the case that a team will, uh, will appoint some sort of a coordinator that will work across the team members to ensure that collaboration is smooth and transparent and consistent. There's another level of collaboration that Future Earth and the Belmont Forum are trying to really work towards with the, with the establishment of these collaborative, um, with, these, with the Future Earth Belmont Forum collaborative research actions. In other words, those that are co-branded by both our organizations and those that Future Earth has really leaned into to help support, we're very much trying to create um, learning and knowledge transfer and community building across the funded teams as well. And so in Belmont Forum proposals, there is a requirement that people put funding in there for travel for key personnel within your team to come to a kickoff meeting typically a valorization meeting at the end where all teams come together and often a, a, a mid-project meeting 
in which we bring the projects together to assess the successes and failures, to change course, to understand from each other what processes are working, where the sticking points are in transdisciplinary research, how, we're, how we are or need help in engaging with uh, stakeholders and, and that work. And Future Earth stays fairly engaged in all of these processes and helps to coordinate those. Um, let's see, I think oh, one more set of questions. Um, <clears throat> Uh, two, set, two more sets of questions, two more questions here. Does the project team have to include three institutions from three different countries? And the answer to that is yes. Or three institutions that are eligible for funding from three different Belmont funders. And that is um, necessary but not sufficient. In other words, you do need to have PIs from three different Belmont, three different countries. And that funding will come from three different funders within those countries. Um, is the project shown in the call per institution or is the budget shown in the call info per institution or per projects? Um, budget restrictions are, are per project are documented in the annexes. And that simply means that in the annex for, the, for NERC or Tibutak, they will have a, or most, they will have a, a, a total amount they're putting in and a per project amount they're putting in. Um, so, so you will see both of those in the annexes. Um, uh, a good, um, a good, uh, a question here that is around the deliverables, and this came also from the last call. You know, what are the expected deliverables, products, or outcome requirements? Is it academic, analytics, data products, or toolkits? And the answer here is that, is that there aren't a lot of requirements. The ambition from the Belmont Forum is clearly to have a, a direct pathway to impact, clearly visible within the project proposal. Um, but at present, you know, the review process for funding um, has an academic focus because of the nature of the funders. Most of the funds in Belmont Forum calls come from fairly traditional science funders. And the Belmont Forum is explicitly, explicitly asking those funders and those, those applying for those funds to stretch, to create projects that do really good fundamental science, but have a better than average opportunity to connect that science to stakeholder processes, to policy processes, to decision processes. So that pathway to impact is, much, is expected to be quite a bit clearer in a Belmont Forum call than a traditional science call. But how you make that happen is very much up to the individual investigator. Um, uh, and then finally, I think these are the last two questions. What is the expectation of involving stakeholders in the application within, the, within this academic research? And it's a, it's a good question. Um, I think the key is that what the Belmont Forum is trying to avoid is someone adding a community partner, a non-science partner, a stakeholder, an NGO partner after the fact. Um, because the, the point of the transdisciplinary research is that the questions themselves are co-designed with potential users of the results. And so your, your non-science partner, your user partner, or community partner is there to help make sure that the way we ask our questions and the methods we use to collect the data is, is really answering a question and in a way that can, be, that can speed the uptake within the user group community. Um, good, good Belmont Forum teams have fairly strong established relationships with some member of the user community or the stakeholder community. Um, last question, how do you involve stakeholders from countries that are not funded? funded? Yeah, and the answer here is it's not terribly useful. Um, it would be fantastic if Belmont Forum had explicit funds for non-science partners in countries that were anywhere in the world. And I think that would, it would significantly increase the effectiveness and uh, of the call in allowing science to most rapidly translate and transition into policy and practice. Creating those relationships with funders that can do that work has been a challenge for the Belmont Forum. And so at present, um, you know, oftentimes successful calls or successful proposals have existing relationships with um, groups within the countries they're working um, that allow them to take advantage uh, um, allow them to transfer that knowledge more effectively. Um, it's, and and, the, and there, there's also a fairly um, open, um, there's, all, there's, an, there's an encouragement within the Belmont Forum of 
of leveraging existing things that are going on, of saying, I've got this great partnership, we're doing this, this research can really help this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure I show you that I have this way of getting the impact through this partnership. So um, build, being creative about how to create those links is, is a part of the process of applying for Belmont Forum funds. Um, another piece in there is that, you know, um, salary, I mean, travel is totally accessible, you, you, uh, uh, applicable. You can put travel funds for people from any country within your proposal. It's the salary funds that are difficult. Um, in some calls, we have found, the Belmont Forum has found ways through this, um, and we're working on that, as I said, by bringing in a, a, a private foundation partner that can fund principal investigators and collaborators um, anywhere in the world, or at least in a much broader, broader set of countries than are currently available to the, the funders that are in the call at present. Okay, that's plenty of information for one webinar. Um, I think it's, it's good to sort of get, you know, any other practical questions out of the way at this point and maybe open it up to other folks and, uh, and we can go and to, to ask questions and we can go from there. And, I'll, and maybe I should first um, see if Chris, if I've missed anything critical about the call process that, um, that you've been a part of that you could add, or Jill's if you have a, anything to add as well. Everything's good from my side. It was uh, quite comprehensive. Um, just anybody, if they want to ask or add something, use your time to uh, reach out through the chat box or simply raise your hand. Uh, and Christy, if you have anything you can add right now. Can you hear me now? Oh yeah, we got you. That's it. All right. I've been. I tried to unmute myself, <laughs> and I don't know why this is accurate. So I'm gonna give a. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but yeah, you're, you. We can hear you now. Fine. Thank you, Chris. Um. Anyone with a. Uh, with a particular question or? There's no questions coming up. Um, maybe we can have a quick round of introductions. Sure, is that on the next slide anyway? You yeah. That? Okay. Yeah, good. Um, that's great. Yes, and, and feel free to ask any kind of practical questions that you find useful. I mean, um, I, I don't, none of us in this call are actually Belmont Forum funders, um, but you know, Gilles and I and, and, and Chris has been deeply involved with the Belmont Forum and Chris has taken this process from the beginning to the end as well. So we might be able to ask, answer practical questions about how to put together a team. One of the ways that, you know, one of the things that's quite useful is also just to get to know other people who are struggling with this process. And we're hoping to send around names of everyone that have been part of the webinars who want to connect so that you can take your conversations offline and work um, to create the kind of teams that are going to have the best possibility of success. Sorry, uh, we just have a question that came in from Ali. Ali, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, thank you very much for all these explanations. Actually, normally, Turkey's Tubitak is asking for the national application in a kind of project uh, application. Uh, I was wondering if there will be a national review process assigned by different national reviewers and there will be an international one. But as far as I understood from your presentation, there will be only a single line that uh, the national reviewers will participate in the international consortium for the review. Is that right? Yeah, I think I understand your question. The question is whether there, there will be a national review process before proposals go to the international review. Is that right? Yeah, 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 that's so. Yeah, I, and, and my understanding is you're absolutely correct. There will not be a process like that. In other words, um, because you know, a, 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 a proposed, a, an investigator from Turkey would likely be, would, would by necessity be working with investigators from two other countries, um, and they're all writing the same proposal. They submit one proposal. Um, I, the, the actual process of submission 
um, then leads to a review process where that proposal is, is compared with all other proposals in one panel. And the reviewers are an international pool of reviewers. Each funder is, is invited to submit names of reviewers from their country. And um, if, you, if a proposal with, uh, with a, if a, a, a proposal comes in with a principal investigator from a given country, I think it's quite likely that at least one of your reviewers will be from the country that you're from. Okay, thank you very much. It's clear. It is an odd process. I, the review process is, part, is a little bit about, about putting puzzle pieces together because fundamentally, if there's only enough money for one good one proposal that includes a Turkish researcher because of the limits that Turkey places on what it's going to put in, then only one proposal that has a Turkish researcher in it and two other, and two other researchers will be funded. Um, and so there's just an interesting process of trying to make sure that all the money gets spent and that the best proposals receive the money. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So maybe for the round of introductions, um, Ali, would you mind taking on the honor of uh, having a quick start? Um, like we already know you're applying from Turkey, uh, but what topic you're interested in and if you're looking for anybody to connect with. Okay, thank you very much for taking the first. Uh, I am attending this webinar actually very late midnight from Turkey. Uh, sorry if my <laughs> voice is a bit, a bit sleepy. Uh, thank you for joining. <laughs> yeah, thank, you. I, I thank, thank you. I thank you all. Uh, I'm civil engineer as a background and with specialization on hydrology and water resources management. Uh, when we face this opportunity to make a project proposal, uh, we have just started to team up uh, internationally. Uh, and we found a partner from Brazil. Uh, they are working cool. on hydroclimatology issues. Uh, our intention is to write a project proposal for the water scarcity issue. Actually, I'm from Izmir in Turkey and the water availability is very limited in this area and the climate change will definitely make a significant effect in this transact. Uh, we would like to concentrate in our, actually, we would like to start with a case study and uh, it will be a drinking water supply reservoir and we will try to assess the direct and indirect impacts of the climate change, uh, focusing first on the heat waves and health issue, and then uh, taking the water scarcity issue, again, with links to the health impacts. Uh, luckily, we have some hydroclimatologists, environmental engineers, civil engineers, water managers in our group, uh, but I think we are missing the, one of the must conditions that there should be at least three partners from the three founding uh, countries. So our intention is welcome to firstly the shortlist of these founding agencies countries, but uh, everybody are welcome to send their interest to my email. So I will ask the moderators from you to share my correspondence with the webinar participants the first one on Wednesday and this one. So uh, I also thank you for giving us this opportunity. Sure, that's fantastic. That's exact, and um, we'll do that. And there's, and there's also a, uh, we're trying to establish some community resources as well on the, um, which we'll share at the end of this as well, other, other mechanisms to reach out and find key research partners that you need for your work. So um, that's great. That will be perfect, thank you. Who's next for the introduction? If we um, systematically go down the list, um, I see Anna next up. Um, are you willing to give your introduction? Otherwise we have Aji. Uh, yeah. 
This is Wenjie. Okay. okay so, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Jill and Josh, for this great introduction. Uh, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wenjie Liao. I'm based in the People's Republic of China. And I would like to apply for the topic on food systems and nutrition. And I'm curious about the question, how to ensure the provision of enough health food and nutrition while meeting our environment and climate goals. Uh, and who are you looking for? Oh, yeah. I, I, so I'm basically uh, looking for anyone who is interested in this question. And uh, of course, I would like to participate in this call. But uh, as I, uh, as, as, as George has answered my question, that and, uh, as a, a participant from the PR China, uh, maybe the chance for me to get a direct uh, funding um, from this call, from the part, uh, partner agencies of this call is, very, is pretty low. But anyway, I, uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's great. I, 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 uh, I would encourage, so uh, PR China does often participate in Belmont Forum calls. And so, but they, like all other countries, they pick and choose which ones they're going to participate in. Yeah. Do we have anybody else that wants to quickly connect? Maybe you can just unmute your mic and uh, speak out. If, um, if if we don't have any, feel feel free to do this at any time. But let me just pop while you're while we're trying to do this. I'm going to pause the sharing for a moment. And then just bring up the BFGo website just to show one more piece of key information. I think there's not much else here, um, but we can continue to talk a little bit. But I want to show you a couple of things. Um, certainly, reach out. Um, these are various ways that you can reach out with Future Earth. I think there is a whole community on Future Earth that is focused on health. That is um, through our open network, and that website is bolded there: network.futureearth.org. And the, in joining the Future Earth um, Open Network, you can connect with researchers in any topic. And there's, like I said, a full community um, of folks working around the world on health issues. And so that is also a way to connect with researchers when you're building your team. Um, and uh, um, various other, um, and then direct emails to the organizers here um, should go to health at futureearth.org. That goes to Gilles, and he can also then help pass questions along to Erica Key, who's the executive director of the Belmont Forum, and to um, Caroline Kershaw, who is the, at, the, at NERC in the UK, who is the lead funder for this call. And so between the two of them, they can answer most questions about eligibility and any technical details on, on putting your team together. Um, but I wanted to also do um, one more thing here. I'm going to pause sharing just for a moment to bring up the actual um, um, Belmont Forum website and just look through it really, just show you one thing. You probably are all very familiar with this, so I will not spend much time on it. Um, there we are, um, and I'll bring this back up. Oh, we're on the wrong place, one moment. Um, okay, so resume sharing, and that should be up again. You should see the BFGo website there. It's a little complicated on my screen. Um, I'll move this. And, and if you, let me maximize this a little bit. If you uh, a look at the top of the screen, the expressions of interest here for climate environments and health is here. Most of, like this, this link for read call documents is key. And check this quite often um, uh, because what you can see right here is exactly who is, um, who currently has annexes up on, on the website. And you, that way you can see exactly what, um, what different agencies are, are putting money into. So you click on one of these for Tipu Tech, for example, 
it'll come up as a PDF. It'll say um, the contact information um, and, and also, you know, the project durations, funding per project, right? So you know exactly how much an individual within a, within, from Turkey is able to then uh, um, acquire through their, through Tipu Tech to, to participate in the project. Um, and, um, and then other details. Um, this, of course, a lot of these will match the others. Um, rules specific to private sector for eligibility and funding. Um, so there's very, there'll be very specific rules depending on where you're coming from, rules for the public sector, et cetera. Um, and so you know, if you have questions on the requirements of applying when you're from Turkey, you have a contact person, you should have fairly detailed um, you know, data on what they're willing to support. And reaching out is always the next best thing to do there. Um, can people see that screen? I can't tell as easily. This still shows up? Yeah. That's great. Okay. Good, good. All right. Excellent. So I just wanted to show you how that works for every country that is there. Um, and then and then also um, we are in Belmont Forum is trying to add at least one more uh, private foundation funder that would allow that whose funding in its annex would um, would be um, much broader in the number of countries that it could support um, so that there can be connections to countries that are not on this list. So that is in process. Um, good. Any other um, questions or slides that I should return back to? I, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the last question from my, I think, this is Wenjie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is there any statistics on the success rate of the core from of the Belmont uh, foreign? Yeah, it's a great question, and the, and there absolutely is. I'm trying to remember what they are. I don't have the slide in front of me. Um, that's a good question. I I they are. Um, I think I, I think the last proposed the last process was something around fifteen percent of initial letters of interest ended up with successful proposals in the um, in the last in the that would be the food energy water um, nexus proposal call so it's the that that was two call that they did one a fairly large one about thirty million in that space with many countries and I think the success rate was about fifteen percent but it's I think important to recognize that the success rate from full proposals might have been greater um, I have to look that up and I I think it's probably better if I get that data from the Belmont Forum explicitly and maybe we can see if we can get that to you by email afterwards. Okay, thank you. Anyway, uh, maybe 20 and that's still something very competitive, I would say. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's quite competitive. Thank you. Um, just to add a little bit, um, on the previous call on Biodiversa and the Belmont Forum, which was 2017-2018, the success rate was 20%. Um, but it does not specify um, if that's from the early stage onwards with the expression of interest or for the full proposals. Yeah, that's about right. Um, okay, thank you. Good. Any other um, questions that people want to raise? It's actually, I think it's a, we, are we at a full hour? Are we at the top of the hour, Gilles? I think we are. Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, I know um, some people are up till one in the evening here, and so, uh, or one in the morning, I should say, so we should probably cut this off at this point. The uh, last bit is that um, Jill's will send out an email to everyone who was a part of it, just making sure that everyone who said that they wanted to be connected with everyone else who joined will be connected, and that way there's a little, there's a small community joining there, and um, I would encourage people to just pop over to our, um, to the open network, which is showing here as well. On, and, and look for other folks there as well and start conversations as needed. Thanks a bunch, everyone, for being a part of this. That's right, and I just wanted to add that I'll be connecting you with the people that joined the first webinar as well. So there's gonna be a bigger pool uh, of people to connect with. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. This is the end of uh, this webinar. If there's anything that you wanna ask, just feel free to send us through the email uh, below. and. Um, yeah, see you next time. Thank you very much and good luck with your applications. Bye-bye. Thank you.